bringing you inside the USL Championship and League One. Segbert's got there for Kalak! He's been knocking on the door! He knocks it down! Diving into all the biggest stories and top headlines. You are ripping and roaring today. This is USL All Access. It's almost impossible to recreate that level of magic. With Mike Watts and Devin Kerr on Sirius XM FC. Welcome, everybody, to USL All Access. A very happy Tuesday, wherever you might be listening. Joined by Devin Kerr and Emmett McConnell producing Mike Watts. Uh, this week, Lee Cohen, the president of the Charleston Battery, joins us. Also, look back at the Open Cup semifinal. Sees Indy 11 bow out after their best performance ever in the tournament. Uh, Nick Markanic on the move and a ton of results that will shake up the playoff picture a little bit. Uh, Devin, uh, you called that Open Cup semifinal. It's best we start there. Perhaps my favorite highlight of the day was Tyler in a trash can and you guys playing keepy uppy uh, during the extensive lightning delay. Well done. Yeah, I appreciate that. We were looking for some content to go back and forth with teams during a said delay. Unfortunately, nobody wanted to be involved, which what was going to end up on social media. So we had to find a way to be creative. And that's just some clever video editing or not really clever at all and me throwing the ball to Tyler him heading it back and forth and then when I head it we clipped to a second look he loved the trash can by the way yeah so that he considered it a second home and um I said you could probably stay there and I don't necessarily know if you would be missed is it us is it Oscar the grouch who's in the trash can correct yeah (laughs) okay Uh, correct not not that Tyler Terrence is in any way grouchy uh Dev, let's talk about the game, shall we? Uh, Open Cup semifinalists in the championship going back to the 08 battery. And for that matter, the 08 Sounders that they beat en route to the final were still in USL at the time. Uh, Rochester in 09, Richmond in 11, Cincinnati in 17, Sacramento went to the final in 2022. And then there's this Indy 11 team, Dev. Um, they went on a total heater in the midst of their Open Cup run that, that certainly buoyed them within the league allowed them to focus up on the quarterfinals uh, against uh, Atlanta, uh, which also dealt with some lightning, believe it or not. Russell in the 14th, Daniel Rosero in the 35th, uh, 2-0 the final, your takeaways. thought that they lacked energy, for sure. It was something that, you know, coming into the game, I actually thought it would be an advantage for them, Mike, because of how good the atmosphere is in Kansas City. One of the best in the United States, for sure. The Casey Cauldron, you know, the foundation that was put forth by American Outlaws in U.S. soccer. And they were still good, the atmosphere, but not great. They just didn't have the energy coming out of the locker room from that delay. You know, and I was texting with with Aiden Quinn during it, trying to see what they were doing to stay active. You know, some guys were eating. Aiden was on 175th cup of coffee. Good to report. Uh, I did discuss, by the way, the possibility of working a new Nespresso machine into his his contract for next season. We need to relay that to the manager. Very smart. They lacked energy. And so it wasn't a tactical thing at first. Sporting put the ball on the deck and they just moved it quickly. And instead of being proactive, they were reactionary. And so they gave up a ton on the inside. They struggled on the wings in transition. In deep, they had no presence up top whatsoever. Shocked that it took them that long to make a change tactically because so much came through the middle, which opened up the width for sporting. It did happen at halftime, and I thought they had about a 20 or 25-minute spell in the second half. The problem was is the damage had already been done, and there was much better chance creation. Tim Melia stood on his head, and he was incredible in goal. And that's what you need in order to make cup runs is you need special moments from special players. So why not from Tim Melia, just one of two remaining players on that team that won the 2017 Open Cup. Only two guys in that dressing room overall. Tim Melia was great and he couldn't score. And and, and they were left, left to dead, honestly. I, it, was the, it was the first time that I've seen Indy this year not struggle within a game, but absolutely get outclassed. I get it was MLS opposition, but they struggled from start to finish. I truly felt bad for them, really. Yeah. Uh, three weeks away from the final. It's on Apple TV. Uh, it'll be LAFC who, who knock out Seattle at Starfire, which to have that happen in regulation, it is hugely infrequent in the last two decades, believe it or not. Uh, and, uh, of course, sporting Kansas City. All right, Dev, uh, we're having Lee Cohen on later, so we don't need to go all the way on Nick Marcanic, but let's get some – First thoughts. It is now official. He's going to La Liga 2 in Spain. CD Castellon, uh, not that far removed from being in the top flight. 
in Spain. Uh, he was drafted 30th overall 2022 out of FC Cincinnati, out of Northern Illinois. Uh, only nine games in MLS, released at the end of the year, goes to Charleston last season, had a nice year, 13 goals all comps. This year, totally blew it out. 29 games, 24 goals, six assists, all competitions. Uh, all 24 of those goals are in the championship. He's one off the league record. Uh, Dev, what can you add to the news that, that's been floating? Certainly deserved for the player who wanted the opportunity to go to Europe. I know that for sure, and I'm sure Lee Cohen will will validate this, that there were a ton of offers that were actually turned down. Um, almost abusive right out the gate because of how poor of an offer it was from the original club, and there were multiple clubs involved. The number itself, 175,000 euros. That's nearly 200K in American dollars. When you look at the conversion, I think it puts it right around 194. That's a massive number that's going to get injected back into that team. You want to hope that that team actually stays up, uh, Spanish squad. Um, the lower divisions of Spain are an interesting one where if you're not in the top two, it, it gets a little murky. We'll say it that way. And so in all of this, you just want to make sure everybody's being done right by. At this point in time, it is. And that his progression continues for as great as it was in the USL Championship. He's still got to be a little bit cleaner on his touches. What does it look like when he gets played on the opposite wing instead of his ability to cut in on that magical left foot? There's a lot to still grow on in terms of growth pattern for this player. I'm sure the club recognizes it. Now it's time to get back to work because this job has only just begun. It is the 11th player from the championship to go to Europe since January of 2022. Uh, let's turn our attention to Orange County. They have made another move. Uh, Morton Carlson went to Lingby early in the summer in June, 41 games with the club, 22 wins. They had an eight-game run that saw them win every match en route to the playoffs last season as the interim. Uh, Paul Hardiman took over in his place two months as the manager, only two wins in 10 games. Uh, Orange County floating down out of playoff position this week. I spoke to Peter Nugent, who was invited on the show, uh, was unable to make that work. Uh, he was on the coach's call we had with Danny Stone. Yes, that Danny Stone uh, earlier in the week described how grateful he was to Paul Hardiman. He ran the IDP for the for the uh, Orange County team, which means a lot of the original sort of moves over to Europe, Kobe Henry and the like, uh, really came through a lot of Paul's hard work as much as anybody. Um, a lot of respect for him within that organization. It just wasn't working. So here comes Danny Stone, brought in three weeks ago. He was the head coach at Phoenix, former assistant. Juan Guerra took the job in January when Guerra went to Houston. Uh, they were in playoff position, Phoenix was, when he got let go. Uh, they were six, seven losses and six draws, uh, left in eighth place. Uh, Dev, what's the takeaway as to uh, what this looks like right now in Orange County? Because it, it's been a whirlwind, dude. It's certainly a great opportunity for Danny Stone. Uh, the fall from grace, to be fair, for both Phoenix Rising and from Orange County is an interesting one. Probably a, a fun debate to be had between you and I, how they got there and then how they get back. You know, I think the vision for Orange County overall is a difficult one to attack, Mike, because in terms of leadership on the sidelines, they've seen so many people depart that position. In terms of personnel, they've had guys in and out. Milanoloski, the goal scorer, obviously his loss of goals, which kind of kept them relevant. And I use that term lightly because so much behind it was ever changing. And also um, Oliver Weiss in, in the front office who goes to the front office for USL championship. Like this team was one of the best and still can be at identification of talent across all levels. And that's gone awry. So you have to find leadership. And I'm not necessarily sure Nugent knows what direction he wants to chase. We're going to see if it starts to cultivate itself, but they still lack an identity for me. And I'm selfishly interested as to what's going to go on in exactly three weeks time right now, where we're going to see Orange County and Phoenix Rising take each other on. That should be a fun one on the sidelines for sure. Yeah. And let's not forget when Danny Stone got let go, always, always Phoenix signage uh, from the supporters there. They felt that was a quick hook for Danny Stone. If if you missed our interview Bobby Dooley, who's the president of that club uh, a couple weeks back, probably worth a re-listen ahead of that. All right, we've got a ton of scores around the league to talk about, and we will do so later. Uh, Lee Cohen, the president of the Battery, set to join us on the move for Marcanic. 
Also, a little update on the Fidel Barajas transfer from RSL to Chivas and what that means for Charleston. It's all coming up here on USL All Access. Let's get back to USL All Access on Sirius XM FC with Mike Watts and Devin Kerr. Welcome back, everyone, to USL All Access on this Tuesday night. Uh, if you miss any part of this show, it's available tomorrow on the USL YouTube page. It's also available in its entirety on the Sirius XM app. Uh, Mike Watts, Devin Kerr, uh, we promised him uh, he's here again. Uh, he's coming close to getting the five-timer leather jacket like they have on Saturday Night Live, I think. The battery president since September of 2022, uh, named Ben Pierman, the head coach the following offseason. Uh, and they, in turn, oversaw the biggest year-over-year -year turnaround in league history, which culminated in the final last year. They are in the news again as they sit second in the Players' Shield race uh, and also uh, making a big splash in the transfer market uh, this summer. Lee Cohen joins us on the show. Uh, Lee, welcome back. The jacket's being made. I think this is four times you've been on this show with the battery. The, the rowdiest time doesn't count. <laughs> glad to glad to be back. It's uh, always fun to be with you guys. Uh, a, a joy to have you. Uh, let's lead with the big news that came out over the weekend. Uh, Nick Markanic is going to be on the move in the winter transfer window. You've come to terms with Castellon of uh, La Liga 2 in Spain. Uh, look, it goes without saying he's had a, a transcendent season. He's on the verge of, of setting the league record for goals. Could very well set the, the club record, which dates uh, prior to the, the modern era of the championship club record for goals as well. Try and describe the, the timeline of this transfer, because I'm sure you've been having people sniff around Nick Markanic all year. Yeah, it's interesting, Mike, because, you know, we sat down and, and did an article with the transfer market, you know, group and organization when, you know, the Fidel deal happened with, with Chivas and it's funny, right? Like I, I, I threw Nick's name in the article and he asked the question, well, is, is there, is there a transfer coming with Nick? It's like, no, you just, you never know. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, and within, you know, I'd, I'd say a couple of weeks later, we got our first interest uh, in Nick and, and our first offer. And I will say we, we, we probably held off for a good 30 days, multiple offers that came through and we just felt, um, you know, I, I would say over the last seven days leading up to it, that this was the right move for Nick. It was a good move for our organization. Uh, but more importantly, we, we felt like it was just another good step for the USL to move another player abroad into La Liga 2, which hadn't been done before. Uh, and we feel like it's it's going to give Nick a really, really good opportunity to be successful. I think when you look at the Fidel deal, it was a good opportunity for him to succeed to then that next move. And we feel really, really strong about this move for Nick to be able to get another move from it from there. Can you maybe let's bring this together right here. Talent identification, not yeah. just the Fidel Barajas or the Nick Markanic, but also getting guys like a Graham Smith, like an Aaron Malloy. Right. I mean, the list goes on and on for the turnaround that you guys have brought into the Charleston battery player identification. Walk us through what that process is like, whether it's investment into players that you are looking to move, and obviously you always want to make a sale, but also guys that you see that can be tenured players. Is it is it a big board, and we've got guys on there that we're just keeping an eye on? How do you go and attack this whole project of who you want to bring in and why? That a boy. Yeah, <laughs> point and click. <laughs> Close our eyes and point. Uh, no, listen, I, I think... You know, with with Ben, yeah, he he has such a good grasp of of soccer throughout the entire United States, globally as as well, and he just he knows the players he likes, knows the players he wants, uh, and then for us, it, it's all about you know during our recruitment process, is making sure they're they're good human beings first and foremost, right? Can they fit into the way and the values that we have here at the organization? And then what I like to say, right, are having a strong spine. I think attacking players are always going to be very successful here in the Charleston battery. When you do have a Leland or a Graham or an Aaron Malloy, Chris Allen, Emilio Icaza, right? You think about that that strength that we have there. It allows our players to get up the field a little bit more and a little bit more aggressively. And I think, you know, Nick, Nick's an interesting one. Uh, FC Cincinnati, you know, let go and let go. He was let go that offseason. And then, you know, you turn around and he came into preseason as a trialist. There, there's a great 
picture on social media of uh, him scoring a goal when he was a trialist. And there's that smiley face emoji that's on his head because we hadn't announced him yet. Fast forward, you know, two months, you know, later, he's scoring goals in the USL championship games to 18 months later, you know, he, he, he's transferred to La Liga too. And so I think, you know, what, what we really try and identify is not just go out and grab quote unquote top players that are, you know, the ones that everybody wants. MD Myers is another great example a uh, player that's got to fit into the Charleston battery way. Uh, and we just, we look for hungry players that maybe have a little bit of an edge to them. Uh, we're done wrong in their minds, maybe from other clubs or other leagues. And they come in here with a, with a point to prove probably how we all feel. So. Lee Cohen joining us. He's the president of the Charleston battery uh, on the news that Nick Markanic uh, will head to La Liga two over the upcoming off season means he will stick around for the remainder of this campaign. Um, do want to preface this by asking, uh, with Nick Markanic, is there a sell-on, as we saw with Fidel Barajas? Is that something yeah. you're, you're able to disclose? Yeah, listen, I mean, I think as part of any transaction we should be doing as a league going forward, we need to retain some of the rights. Uh, we did it with Fidel, and it was extremely beneficial. I mean, Fidel was the first player to get a second transfer within the USL history. So it... It, the precedent is there, right? We we believe that Nick has that ability and, and we do retain a percentage of his rights going forward. It's really, really important for the structure of the deal to, to make sure that we had that. Yeah. So I want to follow on that. Fidel Barajas, essentially, in hindsight, we can look at RSL, essentially flipped him, uh, had yeah. him for about six months on the books, move him on to Chivas uh, in Guadalajara in Liga MX. Um, the numbers on that transfer are clear. Um, if you sort of understand that the nature of, of sell-ons 10 to 20% is, is a number that you hear pretty commonly, um, whether or not you can give an exact number on, on what it looks like is in some ways irrelevant, but can you speak to how that money gets reinvested? Because there's that first sale and there's certainly value there, but yeah. if everything goes right, a lot of times you're going to get more money on the sell-on than you ever got at the front end. Yeah. And listen, I think it's really important for us. You know, did we sit here and think that Fidel was going to transfer within six months after moving him? It'd be like the same thing of when we sat in November of 2022. And I think I sat on a call with you guys. Did you think we would be hosting the USL championship final in 2023? The answer is no. I said yes, right? by the way, just so that we're clear, everybody. At Thank home. you. I, I appreciate that, Devin. The, the answer is no, right? But you, you do the right transactions, you do the right work, and here we were, right, hosting the final in, in 2023, and we put together the right framework of a deal that allowed us to have those rights on Fidel when that transaction happened. It happened sooner than we thought, but we, we thought it was going to happen, and that's why we put it in there. It's the same thing for Nick. We, we do believe that that transaction is going to happen. We do believe Nick is going to be successful and we are going to be able to to benefit from it. And those funds come back in, right? They go back into the organization, whether that's infrastructure in the stadium or infrastructure in and around the club, player development and other opportunities for us to continue to grow and put and reinvest back into the organization. So it, it's really, really important for all of us to be thinking that long term future aspect of it. And it was funny when Barajas came in, he got a handful of games at the tail end of 22 and then obviously exploded in 2023 young player of the year Zeke Soto comes in yeah. is it a similar angle former U.S. under 17 a guy that I think everyone believes has as a ton of talent or is it a mixture of he may get there but we know he can help us now yeah I think whether it's Fidel Barajas or Tristan Traeger that moved from the Charleston Battery to Monterey Derek Dotson went from the Charleston Battery, Minnesota, Trey Muse, Charleston Battery to Portland, Dante Bovara comes in six months, probably didn't have the opportunity to get a renewal at Aberdeen, does a very, very well job here, gets a new three-year contract, right? I think we look at all of these as independent situations, right? Zeke Soto comes in and we'll assess him day in and day out. And we, we can't compare him to Fidel or you can't compare him to Nick. He's his own individual person. And we don't think that's right to put comparisons to, to players. Uh, it's just, it's just not how we do things. We try and identify paths for each of them. Uh, whether you're Juan David Torres, who I, I, I don't think he knows how to score 18 yards in. I think everything he scores all year is, is, is 18 yards and out. Uh, we, we, we just try and create opportunities for all these guys to be successful.
you can compare, though, the path that has started to become more prevalent for USL championship players to Europe. You know, you mentioned names out of your organization, but Jonathan Gomez from Louisville City in 2022. Uh, certainly Junior Flemings with his time at Phoenix uh, and then Birmingham, who transferred him to Toulouse and in Ligue 1. You know, Kobe Henry, Ocean Dina, Milan Olowski, the list goes on and on. Mark Hennick is just the next one. It's actually 11 since January of 2022. My question is this. How would you describe this market? I would use the word emerging for sure to people outside of the United States and to other leagues when you're trying to cultivate these players. And let's be very clear, pitch them. Pitch them because they're assets and everybody's trying to you're trying to do what's best for the club, certainly for the team now and also for the player. But how are you getting all of that information to these locations and saying this is the right person for your team and here's why? Yeah. Listen, I think you use the word emerging. I actually think, you know, well, it's emerging from the standpoint of people are now following us more. These players have always been here in this league. Mm-hmm. These players have been around. There's talent that's been here for for quite some time. I would say the media coverage is is, is allowing us more globally to be in that right light. Uh, there's a platform now that our games are getting coverage. It, you may think it's weird, but ESPN top tens when they see players scoring goals here locally, it, it pushes out. People start talking about it, right? The Golaza. Uh, there's there's more and more countries that are that are scouting the U.S. markets. They have scouts here that are watching these games and then are getting stuff back. Ramon from CD was a former player that like he's the technical director. He was a former player that played in the NASL, knew the league, knows the country. And so you're getting players that have been in the U.S. market for quite some time that are now globally running clubs. Think about all the American investment that's happening abroad. They're very familiar with the USL. They're very familiar with the success of the league. They're very familiar with Major League Soccer. And so they're they're looking at it and saying, hey, let's not look at the American market as an unknown. Let's look at the American market as it's it's known. We just have to untap it. Uh, and there's been very, very good players that have been in this league that have come from abroad that are going back and also talking about the USL championship. I think that is extremely important as well. Uh, it, it's it's not, you know, this this new league. It's been around for a long time. Their players have been coming in and out of. Lee, you and I have conversations all the time about players within the league, the pathway for them, certainly their relation to the American soccer pyramid. So let's bring it together here. Undervalued is what I can take away a little bit from you know the words you just utilized. I certainly would, would use that if I was to express it. Is, it. is it possible to find a way, not just for the Charleston Battery, but for USL championship teams to create a pipeline more frequent to the top tier in the United States. I'm obviously specifically referencing MLS because that's not something that takes place often. And yet I think you and I can both agree. Mike Watts would say the same thing. Plenty of other people in the front office that the talent is there and the possibilities in theory should be there as well. Yeah. Uh, The Fidel transfer and then the second move is a great example of why there should be players that are coming out of the USL ecosystem and, and going into Major League Soccer. But RSL probably does it better than anybody else. Diego Luna, and I will say this, RSL was also thinking about Nick Markhanek. I mean, they they are a club that is that is looking in and moving through. You could go back and look at Philly or, or, or the Red Bulls, right? Think of how strong those teams were that are moving players through the USL ecosystem, played into the first team, and then they've gotten those second transfers. They just didn't have to have the transfer in – because those, those 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 teams were within their their ecosystem, I do believe as as a country, the more that we can transact globally within the USL and Major League Soccer markets, the better we'll be, and the more we'll continue to have player development within our own country. Speaking it's going here- it, it is going to be coming right because I think the more sorry I'm gonna uh, one last thing I when you do continue to find more players like your Zeke Sotos of the world, right, the, that are that are coming in. The young player that Birmingham just signed from Sporting Kansas City's academy. Th- these players want to come in. They want opportunities to play first-hand professional games with a first team. Uh, and they can get – we can give them minutes. We can give them minutes now, and we can give them minutes to develop them against uh, against men. 
speaking with Lee Cohen, president of the Charleston Battery, uh, Eastern Conference of USL Championship, currently sitting second place, 53 points behind Louisville City. Also sitting second place for the overall number one seed, the Player Shield, as it's referred to in the USL Championship. Lee, one more follow-up on kind of this whole process before we get to this year's team and their progressions. How about replacement of those players? Because for a Fidel Barajas, we can go specific, certainly for Nick Markanik. Number one, respectfully, I don't think anybody had it on their bingo card that he was going to drop 25, maybe 20 plus goals, we'll just say, and we'll see what the future number is, that he was going to do that. But also, if you take those num- numbers, they're not anomalies, they've been up and down, but they've been extremely impactful for your team. So you're weighing what the financial value is for the player and his opportunity, certainly what it is for the club. But let's be very clear. His goals aren't there anymore. You have to find a way to replace those. And that's not a player that's just readily available. So how do you assess that situation of how it's going to impact you? Certainly, you mentioned the utilization of money, but then attacking when those players depart, how you're going to bring the new ones in. Yeah, I mean, this can transition right into this year as well, too. We, We lost 47 goal involvements last year. 47 goal involvements. Between Fidel, Augustine Williams, Beto Avila, Tristan Traeger, Derek Dotson, 47. That's a lot. It's not something we're concerned about. I mean, we we, we knew we had Nick that would, would provide us those opportunities. We went out and we, we acquired MD Myers. And so, again, I go back to we, we look at our strengths. Our strengths are going to be our, our back four and our, our middle three. And we can build around those guys with 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 going out and being patient. Juan de Torres showed up on our doorstep, showed up on our doorstep. And you just, Ben always has a saying, you, you find one of your top players in March and literally found one of our top players in March. Nick was the same way. Nick was the same way the year before. I mean, it, it just, it, you just, if you're patient, things, things will unfold. I was going to say, or you're Pittsburgh and you find all your players in March, but that's a whole different <laughs> kettle of fish. Um, Lee Cohen's with us. He's the president of the Charleston Battery. Um, to further the conversation about this year's team, uh, Aaron Malloy has been down with injury. Um, it's it's not been precisely given a timeline as for when he returns. You guys acquired Jay Chapman off Hartford. Um, try and describe the, the value of getting Jay in here at this stage, for one. And also, are you done? The roster freeze is six days away. Are you done or are you still looking? Yeah, listen, I'll go to the roster freeze question first. You know, last year, you know, we were we were actively just looking around and nosing around, seeing what was there. And uh, we made a deadline transaction and Mark Segbers, right? But if, uh, six days out, we probably weren't really thinking about, was this something that we were going to do? And it's probably right now, Ben and I spoke last night, you know, unless something major happens, this week, we feel like the group that we have is the group that we will have going forward, and, and we're extremely excited about. Jay was 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 a, was a great addition for when Aaron went down. Very unfortunate situation for us to lose Aaron, um, but having that, that what I would say unique skill set of of knowing what's going on around the league and who's available and who's ready to to make a move. And uh, when when we heard that Jay was available. We thought it was a natural replacement to bring him in. Uh, he played with Ben at Michigan State, so very familiar with with him as a person. Uh, and we felt like his skill set could could fit right in and join in with with Chris Allen and Emilio Icaza. And then when Aaron comes back, uh, it makes it really really strong. And, and it's it's interesting because you know whether you, whether Devin said this earlier on in in one of the the USL shows, you know, is what happened if we had an injury. Um, you know, we we do carry a smaller squad, and and I gave Devin a hard time because you know while you guys were talking about we, we were missing Arturo Rodriguez for the better part of the beginning part of the season, uh, and the team finds ways to to go out and and, and produce. It's the same thing with, with Aaron, right? It's 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 such a good group of of individuals. Uh, and then quickly being able to bring someone like Jay in adds to that. So really excited about, you know, where we're at and, and the group that we have. I'm not sure I've been so politely smacked across the knuckles in front of a national radio audience before ever than I would just was by Lee Cohen. <laughs> uh, r- reminder that when we had that conversation, I believe it was before your Open Cup game against Atlanta United earlier this year. Actually, the goalkeeper got hurt, too. It was. 
it was sure. it, it, it yeah i mean it, it, it we were actually I remember walking up and down the bleachers talking about it uh yeah it, and adam had just broken his nose uh right in the birmingham game um you made a comment a second ago talking about your strengths um you know your back line your midfield three i think it's a real testament to people at home who either maybe haven't paid enough attention or aren't familiar with the charleston battery that you comment about the back line the middle and then statistically if you look at the offensive numbers your md mars your Arturo rodriguez your juan davids your nick Marcanics, these are all guys that from those comments maybe people are thinking oh let me go look at the defenders let me go see who the holding midfielders are and yet top 25 statistically of most offensive categories in the usl championship a testament to to the guys that you were referencing let's talk about the group though um in my opinion i think mike watts would support this as well it's basically become you and louisville right now that's that's what it is for the number one overall in the usl championship that is the player shield it would be the number one in the eastern conference you got the road to the final to run through you last year what does this road towards the end of the year look like for you guys in order to track them down with their games in hand and then come postseason time although you've traded blows this year how do you then get over the hump to make sure that the opportunity once again rests at patriots point to chase a title yeah listen i, I think you know it, this is why i'll go back to the question mike asked you know what what could happen in the next six days look at look at the western conference I think everybody still has a chance for for the eight seats and nobody's really going to transact or move players out because they still think they have a chance. I'd say it's pretty much there outside of Miami in the Eastern Conference as well, where where everybody has a, a puncher's chance to to still get in to the top eight. I, I think for us, we're going to we're going to spend, you know, the remaining seven games trying to get that right 11 and and that's the focus right if 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 we can catch louisville fantastic let's hold off whoever we need to hold off that's chasing louisville and, and us for you know the, those top seeds in the east and the overall player shield I, I think these things all have a way of sorting itself out you know nobody would have thought that pittsburgh would have lost last year they were top team all season long uh, come playoff time, it's just what makes American sports so exciting is that anybody in the playoffs can can beat anybody. And that's actually, you know, what, what this league is about. Every, there's, there's no easy game that exists out there. And, and so we're, we're going to use the next seven weeks making sure that we are where we want to be going into November 2nd so that we can win the last four. Lee, sorry, fun one here. I'm just jumping in before Mike Watts gets out. We're on a group chat with a specific Western Conference coach, and last week, Mike Watts described the everyone below the top four in the Western Conference as a complete and utter freak show. <laughs> it was an incredible description that certainly had some, some fun back and forth in that group chat. That person, by the way, will remain nameless at least this point in time. Um, no disrespect to anybody else, certainly in the West, and what I'm going here is in the East. It's Louisville, it's you guys, and then it's basically everybody else because there is a 10-point gap. How would you describe the Eastern Conference this year, and how would you describe it in comparison to the West on the second part of that? Yeah, um, you know, it's really hard to say uh, the, on the West because we don't play everybody twice. It, it, it does have its challenges to really figure out, you know, how even each are. I, I think early on in the year, uh, aside from maybe us, Louisville and, and Tampa, the West was getting a good number on the East early on in the year. And then I think it kind of balanced out throughout the, the course of the year. Listen, it, it it is really, really challenging to go from the East to the West. Uh, going back, you know, two or three time zones, the travel that are associated with it. So I think sometimes, that, you know, the Western Conference teams, when you're like, for example, for us, right, playing at nine o'clock at night, this you know, Eastern on, on um, Saturday night in San Antonio, that's a challenge, a challenge to your body clock. It's a challenge to the way you go about preparing. So I do believe there's a little bit of advantage um, to Western conference teams when they are hosting teams in the East with, with that being said, the, the teams in the East, uh, I don't think it's as spread out as, as people see um, the games in hand, I think will will bring a lot of the teams a lot closer than the, than the 10 point gap. But I do think, you know, that there is there, there's going to be a race for the top four. I'll, I'll say that there there is going to be a race for the top four. Um, 
anybody can fall off to, to us or Louisville, but um, I doubt that's going to happen. It, it is, it is going to be exciting. I'll call it last two months of the USL season. Such a PR cop out. He's always going to survive in politics. It's incredible. Good job, Lee. <laughs> well done. Uh, all right. Uh, that's Lee Cohen, the president of the Charleston Battery. Miss a part of the interview. It's available on the Sirius XM app in its entirety. And tomorrow, uh, with much needed video uh, on the USL YouTube page. Lee, appreciate the time and look forward to having you back again soon. Yeah, hopefully I collect that jacket next time. May mail it ahead of time. Yeah, will do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's Lee Cohen. And, uh, we take a look at some of the other results of the weekend and get you ready for next weekend. Next on USL All Access. Giving insight to all the biggest moments in championship and League One. This is USL All Access on Sirius XM FC with Mike Watts and Devin Kerr. We're back here on USL All Access. If you missed any part of a great interview with Lee Cohen that covered a lot of ground, 25 minutes. Uh, it is available tomorrow on the USL YouTube page. It's also right here on the Sirius XM app. Uh, all right, Dev, the roster freeze is only six days away for USL. Uh, you'll see different dates for different leagues in this country. For instance, it's today for the NWSL, but it is September 9th in USL Championship. Uh, Dev, let's chat about a couple of the uh, big moves that have come already, knowing full well, as Lee Cohen alluded to, uh, some teams don't even know yet whether or not they're going to get something over the line uh, until much later. Malik Foster leaves Colorado Springs, goes to Indy. That occurred right after we taped this show last week. I think the best way to put it is uh, both sides have worn out their welcome a little bit. It was probably for the best. Did I miss the mark? <laughs> the story behind it is incredible, by the way. It, it I is. I wish we could share this on air. This is, it's one that I have never heard nor experienced as a player or announcer in my entire life. Have you? No. And there's a reason why. And, and look, no illegality, no. I no, mean, no, it's no, just, no. it's just, you know, Ill one action. Ill-tempered, maybe. <laughs> Ill-tempered, Ill, Ill, Ill Seabass. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> they have laser beams. Can I Lasers. just get some sharks with some freaking laser beams on their heads? Uh, I Yeah, I, let's just go with one action can have a, a butterfly effect in a room. Perfect. So certainly lose speed, uh, lose confidence, lose decent vision. Indy gains all of that. It was actually something I spoke with at length um, with head coach Sean McCauley of Indy 11. Again, as you mentioned, we had just recorded and then this news came out. I got an opportunity to have him for Open Cup in that match that we pre or excuse me, in the match that we reviewed in segment one. Feels very confident about what the addition could be for Indy 11 for a team, number one, that is battered and bruised beyond belief. More on that in a second, especially on the defensive front. But he feels like that profile of player Malik Foster for their front line and what it gives them. They're shifting back and forth between three up top and two tens or two up top and one ten underneath. I actually think it helps here because if you find a way to get one of your strikers on, on a good streak going here, you know, whether it be um, Augie Williams or, or Douglas Martinez, maybe you're not playing them both. And instead you're playing one Malik Foster underneath gives you one look and a Gwenzadi gives you another right now. It's basically just Gwenzadi, although they did just get Jack Blake back. So a little bit more of a, a free shifting motion on that front line, which they need, although defensively they've been heavily struggling. Yep. Uh, Indy making a change defensively. Uh, Want to introduce Hayden white to the folks. Yeah. So Hayden white, you have to understand for Hayden white, 29 years of age already over 300 professional appearances only 15 goals and 17 assists, but this is about stability for a guy that has experience in the Premier League reserve squads. Um, US, or excuse me, USL. The English system championship. In England, thank you. League One and League Two, which respectively is the third and fourth divisions in England, as well as National League. National League can be broken up into different quadrants around the country, but for all intents and purposes, it is fifth division. This is going to be a right-sided player who could play in theory on the back three, certainly within a back four. I would imagine this gives you a little bit more luxury to shift into a four more regularly, certainly bump him up high in the wing back position and possibly into that right back spot. But Mansfield Town, Blackpool, Walsall, most recently, Epsfleet United that he comes over from, that was in National League. And this is going to give them some help because, again, they've really struggled for bodies on that back line. Probably the biggest reason defensively, Sean McCauley says, 
that they've been giving up goals left and right because there's no frequency of occurrence in that lineup. Yep. Uh, all right. Let's turn our attention to Rhode Island FC. Uh, it's a reacquisition on loan. Uh, Jack Paniotu uh, from the Revs. Look, he, he he added a real spark to that team when he first came in. Disappointing when he got called back. Dude's played in three different divisions this year, Dev. Um, can he bring that same spark to a team that at the beginning desperately needed it? And now it feels like um, just just an add to a group that, that's already found its way. Yes, he can. And I believe that he has the capability to be the number one choice selected player within that midfield. Agreed. I think I think he's that good. He's that consistent. Talking to the Revs organization behind the scenes, certainly seeing him in person and what he's capable of on the field. It's an area for me, for Rhode Island, that they've been very good in at times, but they've also struggled to evolve within games and their inability to respond within a game. That's where Jack Paniotu can come in because he's so good. He can be that high line that pushes the tempo, but also sitting deep and controlling everything, whether it's side-by-side, -side, flat in the midfield, or a three-man midfield. I have the belief that he will come in and help stabilize this, which can then give them that extra bump as they continue their ascension up top of the Eastern Conference. All right, speaking of ascension, let's talk about some results from the week. Great week for the Switchbacks. Two wins. They win midweek against Memphis. 2-0 uh, on a brace from Jonas Fjeldberg inside six minutes. Then they win again against Tulsa. They're up 4-0. Uh, late goal as well for, for Tulsa. That's all they could muster. Jairo Enriquez scored just the second minute. Uh, Colorado Springs, that's six very valuable points. The last name you just used, Tyro Enriquez, and I would actually probably go back to the one prior, Jonas Feldberg. Those two guys, man, it, it ceases to amaze me. Some of the level that I see out of them, I think you'd probably agree, Mike, that you can watch them sometimes and go, why are they in this league? I mean, and I mean that in all due respect to everybody in the USL Championship because of the product that they put out. That's a full national team player in Jairo Enriquez who can absolutely boss games, but there are times that you don't know that he's on the field. Jonas Feldberg and his progression as a pro, bouncing from organization to organization, getting him stabilized in one spot, I think has been a real good thing for him in Colorado Springs. The hope is that the growth continues. I need a little bit more on the defensive front, though I do think it, it feels like they've, they've figured out their crew there. Yep. Uh, Louisville traditionally struggles with North Carolina on the road. And you could say in some ways they did. It was at a point three three. Louisville wins six goals to four. It is a record for own goals, three in the game. Uh, Paco Craig scored one of those, marking his first goal for Louisville since 2019. Ha ha. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, Manny Perez back into the group uh, right before the roster freeze as well. I'd imagine Louisville's probably darn near close to done as it pertains to the roster movement at this point, already having added Philip Goodrum. Uh, but Louisville maintains their place atop the East with two games in hand by three points. That's some of the best shade I've seen in a while, by the way, for any club to throw at someone. Yeah, the fact that, that <laughs> I mean, who tweets that? Who, I have, who I have an idea who Twitter tweets there. it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna blow up their spot right now. Are you gonna blow her spot up? I don't think it's her. Oh, in game, I don't think it's her. Oh, all right. Yeah, I know. I'll text you the name. Everybody all at right. home is like, "What are they talking about?" I Let's know, put it this way. The comms department at Louisville City, one of the best in the business. A uh, ton of respect for them as people. I, I just the, the person that Mike thinks it is, I don't believe she is the person who handles in-game <laughs> in-game Twitter and social media. We'll put it that way. Funny story about this, by the way. Sunday morning, traveling home from my MLS game in Charlotte, head down. I pick my head up. I'm in C terminal at Hartsfield Jackson, Atlanta, and I I'm probably seven feet from Danny Cruz. And he's looking to his left, and I just lowered my shoulder and trucked him. And he looked up like the second coming of Christ was also, well, follow was also followed by the devil himself. And I wasn't sure as to whether or not he was going to respond with a hug or absolutely clock me across the concourse. Turns out I got neither. Instead, we discussed his breakfast choice selection. But we did discuss the game, and it was one of those ones where he wasn't in stadium, actually stayed back at the hotel to watch the match, uh, discuss the overall form of the team. You know, certainly the the sideline cast that was, God, you got to love seeing those boys and, and Paolo Del Piccolo as those lead assistants, right? Yep. And kind of a one-off of get in, get out, and it's done. It happened. Like There's not much to take out of it outside of the hi historic value in the three own goals. Um, What is his breakfast choice? Is he a burger at 9 a.m. kind of guy? No, no, no. This is... 
I actually thought it was a little bit tame for him. They were on the go. So maybe that's why. But I didn't recognize the location of purchase. But it was standard white bread, sliced diagonally, scrambled eggs. I don't know as to whether or not there was cheese in it. Looked a little cheesy to me. He seems like a cheese guy. Yellow American and some diced up eggs is pretty good. And I believe there was bacon on it. It looked delicious. Certainly nice little butter sear on it. Mm. Okay. Would you what do you have a normal breakfast choice? I don't eat breakfast usually. Neither neither, you. Neither, well, sometimes you snack on stuff. I do. Yeah. Yeah. A, a good back, a good bacon, egg, and cheese goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah. Anywho, uh, a couple other scores we, we need to race by now. San Antonio and Charleston finished 1 1 late goal for Juan David Torres in the 84th in that game. San Antonio seed 70% of the ball, trying to, to recapture perhaps how they've won in, in past years in that game. Had a lead, didn't work out. Uh, Oakland won nothing over New Mexico. Uh, fifth anniversary for the club. So Ricky and I snuck in 40 references to part owner G. Easy. Uh, it was a real joy. Also to Dom Dwyer, first goal in a decade in the league, 76 minute. It was their only shot on target. New Mexico managed just two of their own. They were down four starters, although it appears none of them are long term from the previous game. Uh, Phoenix and Loudon, brutal weather. Uh, Margarita scores late winner 84th for his new club. Big win for Phoenix. Uh, Miami staves off elimination. Yes, I am saying that. They could have been eliminated if they had lost to Monterey Bay, but they're alive, baby. Uh, Monterey's tailspin continues. I should note, enjoyed speaking with Jordan Stewart. Think he's got a bright future. Frank Yollop and Ramiro Corrales had a lot of support in that room. A lot of support. Uh, Rhode Island, 2-0 over Birmingham, Dev. Sweep the season series in the Cano Bowl. Mike, true or false, Rhode Island FC finishes in the top four. Uh, true. True. Yep. Interesting, by the way, before we go to break, interesting that we were just talking about two and a half, three weeks ago about the possibility of Detroit City, given the form that we had seen, maybe not even making the playoffs, who, as we're talking, virtually hold that number four spot just by one point, I might add. And that's been their goal the whole way. Also, Pittsburgh draws Indy. Pittsburgh down a man 86 minutes. But uh, Romario Williams, 90 plus 7 equalizer. When we come back, a look at the national games of the week. Also, our top games. It's coming up right here on USL All Access. You're listening to USL All Access on Sirius XM FC. Here are your hosts, Mike Watts and Devin Kerr. We're back on USL All Access. Let's get you caught up on some games this weekend that you'll want to keep an eye on. Won't be too hard to get a hold of the Louisville Loudon game Friday, 7.30 p.m. because you're already tuned in right where you need to hear it. You're on Sirius XM FC 157. Also in Spanish and Espanol, tu DNA. Uh, Phoenix and Tulsa close out Friday night, ESPN 2, 11 p.m. Eastern time. It's worth noting Miami must win on Friday against New Mexico or they are eliminated. Uh... I, I thought I'd get a better laugh out of that, but I didn't. It's unreal to even hear that. I am I'm blown away by that stat. Sorry. Indeed. All right, Dev. Uh, top game. No, Indy already watch. lost, Mike. It, what? That was my dad joke of the day. You said indeed, and I said indeed. I have three right. kids, man. What do you want from me? I, I get it. Uh, speaking Thanks. of, a couple games to keep an eye on next week. Hartford and Indy. Hartford's only four points out. Uh, Indy has dropped out of the top four. Monterey and San Antonio. Monterey. Uh, are now two points beneath the line. San Antonio loses that game. They're six back with eight left. Call that the the first six-pointer at the Western playoff line this year. Uh, Colorado Springs and Tampa Bay. Switchbacks could be in second place with a win and the right results elsewhere. It's also a huge measuring stick game. Uh, Dev, I'm watching Pittsburgh, Rhode Island. It's the Dequa return game. Uh, Pittsburgh, nine unbeaten now, but five draws. Uh, Rhode Island only one point away from that home playoff game that we predict that they'll get to. Uh, I think I know which one you're looking at. I'm looking at two. There's one that carries more value. The first one is actually Colorado Springs and the Rowdies. Uh, Colorado Springs' ability to chase down that coveted top four spot. Also, the Rowdies, who are basically have no chance of catching the Charleston battery. And in theory, whomever ends up in fourth is not going to catch them either. So keeping them motivated to try and find a way to get to the end of the season but it's certainly got to be the Charleston Battery and Sacramento Republic game for me. Charleston Battery, 3-3-1 three, three, and one against teams in the top four. They are hosting Sacramento Republic, who are 3-3-0. Three, three, oh. So basically 500 when push comes to shove. 
The midfields for me are the conversation right now on the attacking side. Sacramento Republic trying to recreate in the 10 still. We've seen some good form from Nick Ross. Certainly doesn't hurt that you've got Russell Cicerone up top who scored in their game against San Antonio. But the Charleston battery, as we talked about with Lee Cohen, it's it's certainly never going to be the same when you don't have Aaron Malloy, regardless of what that timetable is, and finding a way to get that same sort of chemistry down underneath, no matter the personnel. Lee Cohen, as I do, feels that the, the spine of that team, the back four and the midfield, is the most important thing to allow the attacking prowess to continue. If they want to make a run at this thing, they've got to find a way to get Jay Chapman on the same page as everybody else. He's clean, but they got to be clean together. Dev, did you learn anything from this show? Uh, I learned that if it was possible, Lee Cohen was more impressive than we even anticipated given prior interviews. Uh, Agreed. I also found that I've got a Fordham soccer scarf in my basement. I'm adding this to the backdrop ASAP, y'all. Love Uh, that. I know. His name's ASAP Rocky, by the way. All right. I already Two did dad the jokes in five minutes. You're welcome. I already did the GEZ references this week. Uh, for Devin, Emmett, Mike, uh, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again next Tuesday night. Enjoy the games this weekend, everyone. So long for now. This is USL All Access. If you missed any portion of the program, listen back anytime on the SXM app.